Uh, we are in Acts. If you're new here today, uh, we've been in Acts for a long time, almost two and a half years. Um, and uh, we have six sermons left, including today. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so st- yeah, some people are very excited about that. Um, <laughs> Maybe a little too. So we'll be done, actually. June 2nd will be our final Acts message. So you're not going to want to miss that. Mark your calendars for it. Uh, I'm hoping we can have a little bit of a celebration because it has been, uh, it's been, a, it's been a long time. It's been a long time, but uh, it's been a lot of fun. So we're going to be back in the book of Acts today. And as I was researching and kind of going through what was happening in Acts chapter 26, I was reminded of a song that I was introduced to in the early 2000s. Um, it was a song that was actually written in 1992, uh, but has since been covered by numerous um, co- uh, authors and uh, musicians and artists like the Robbie C Band, which was one of my favorite bands in the early 2000s. Um, my wife knows when I was leading worship, I'd sang all their songs at that time period. They're no longer together, but they did a rendition of this, this song that was so incredibly powerful. And the name of the song is Beautiful Scandalous Nights. And I just want to read the words of the chorus to you, and we're going to kind of talk about what the author of this song, I think, is really getting at and how it attaches to our our passage today. The chorus of the song goes like this, at the wonderful, tragic, mysterious tree, on that beautiful, scandalous night, you and me were atoned by his blood and forever washed white on that beautiful, scandalous night. Isn't that beautiful? The song actually points out something that I think often gets overlooked inside and outside the church. And that is the scandalous nature of the message of Jesus. There is nothing sterile or clean cut about what Jesus did and said during his time on earth. It is beautiful and it is scandalous. The message of Jesus, it calls into question most of what we believe in this life. It flips cultural norms on their heads. It has the power to divide households and friendships. It reveals truths that are so countercultural, they almost don't seem believable. Even the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus can cause all measures of skepticism for a person. Jesus himself, his comments uh, on one of the most controversy passages, con- controversial passages in all of the scriptures that he says, he comments on the scandalous nature of his own life, his own mission, and his own message. In Matthew chapter 10, he's actually quoting Micah chapter 7, and he says this, Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Some of you are like, wait, what? I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I think that one happens way too often. (laughs) Daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws. He says, your enemies will be right in your own household. You see, on this side of heaven... Jesus came, he says, uh, elsewhere, to bring peace to the soul, but not necessarily to the earth. That will come later. But for now, he says, look, there's going to be division. This is such a scandalous message that I've come to bring that even the people in your own household, they may rebel against it. It may divide you in some ways. The scandalous nature of the gospel will divide people as much as it will connect them. And this is what happens when people make Jesus supreme in their life. Stuff starts to change for them. Some of you have experienced that. Priorities are altered. Lifestyles are renewed. Choices are adjusted. And you know what? The people closest to you, they don't always agree with you. And while you may respond in one way, they likely will respond in another. And so because of that, the response of people towards the scandalous message of Jesus, it can vary greatly. In fact, you have responded, no matter who you are, 
you've responded in a particular way to the message of Jesus and all of the aspects of it. And whatever response you've given greatly determines what the future holds for you, both now and into eternity. As we turn our attention back to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 26, we're going to re-enter the story of Paul, who is now standing before Festus, who's a newly appointed governor in the area around Caesarea, and his friend, King Agrippa, who happens to be the Jewish king in and around Jerusalem. And where we last left off, Paul tells them first this incredible story about how his life was changed by an encounter with the living, resurrected Jesus, and that he decided his response to that was to be obedient to the vision that Jesus had given to his life. And as he stands before Festus and Agrippa, who are trying to decide the fate of Paul, Paul has now appealed to Caesar. He said, listen, nobody knows what to do with me. I want to talk to the man. I want to talk to Caesar. They're trying to figure out, okay, we'll grant that wish. You're a Roman citizen, but I don't even know why we would send you there. The accusations against you seem weak at best and completely irrelevant at worst. Like there's just nothing that we can kind of stick a flag in and say, look, this is why we're going to send Paul to Caesar. And so they're sitting with Paul and they're trying to figure out, what do we do with you? Festus even brings King Agrippa in. He's like, maybe you'll understand this better. And so Paul is having this defense before them. And as he does, he finishes his defense with a flourish. So if you haven't done yet, you can open up the Version Bible app and you can follow along with everything I'm going to read. Uh, you can take notes in there. All the discussion questions are in there for your small groups this week. Uh, make sure you take advantage of that as well. If you're in your Bible today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 26, starting in verse 20. Luke writes this, I preached first to those in Damascus, this is Paul speaking, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they have changed by the good things they do. Some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this, and they tried to kill me. But God has protected me right up to this present time so I can testify to everyone from the least to the greatest. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead, and in this way announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles, non-Jewish people, alike. Suddenly, Festus shouted, Paul... You're insane. Too much study has made you crazy. High schoolers, too much study will never make you crazy, I promise. Okay, keep doing it. Here's the reality. Paul loves a captive audience, okay? There's a couple of places in the book of Acts where Paul is like willing to risk his own life just to talk to a bunch of people. He wanted to get the message out. And so, because of that, he will talk about Jesus to anybody who's willing to listen. And in this case, he'll talk to the governor and the Jewish king at the time and tell them about the very thing that he is being put on trial with them and accused of talking about and doesn't seem to care what might happen to him. Come what may, he is going to talk about Jesus. But as we see here, Festus doesn't have a very favorable response. In fact, Festus' response is one of three common responses to the scandalous, beautiful message of Jesus. And his response is to attack. He goes after Paul. Festus isn't a fan of what Paul is explaining. In fact, he just blurts out, you're a crazy person. You have to be totally crazy to believe this kind of stuff. You've got your, heads in the, your head in the weeds and you don't even know what you're talking about. And you should be in a mental institute, Festus is saying to Paul. Often the response to Jesus' message and very, various aspects of it, which is important, I think, for this, those of us listening today, it, the response can often be this way. 
It can be met with aggressive attacks in an effort to disprove or reject any notion of it being true. And it could be towards Jesus himself, or it could be towards the person who's talking about Jesus, like in this case. So common was this attack on Christianity and the message of Jesus in the first century that those who spoke of it weren't just attacked verbally like Paul is here, but were attacked physically as well. In fact, Paul's current predicament is because Jewish leaders from Jerusalem are attacking the message of Jesus that he keeps talking about. They want Paul dead because of it. Now, is it possible that you have been attacking the message of Jesus for most of your life? In an attempt maybe to disprove it or just reject it, to look for a loophole of some kind, you have lashed out in criticism or anger towards the gospel and those who follow Jesus. And I would say this, one, I'm glad you're here. Two, God is a gracious God who loves you still. But what's even more possible, I think for all of us in this room, is that we have chosen to attack certain truths within Jesus' message that we either don't like or we reject. Maybe when Jesus talks about money, you're the first person to become critical of his message. That's not what he really meant. Maybe when the Bible talks about sex and marriage and its proper place, you become angry and you attack its paradigm. Or maybe when Jesus talks about forgiveness, you aggressively reject it because of someone who sorely wronged you that you could never imagine forgiving in your life. You know, I'll admit that I've been in this place many times before. I didn't like a portion of the message of Jesus, right? I, and my response was to attack it or to find a loophole or to reject it or no, Jesus really, he, what he meant was this. In an effort to prove my point, and I just want to make this point because it's a common response in all of us. At some level, we are prone to attack the scandalous message of Jesus, either on a macro level, just who Jesus is and what he did, or on a micro level, the things that he talks about that challenge our inner thinking and our selfish, sinful nature. We have a, we have a tendency to do that. It's a common response. Not just outside the church, friends but right here amidst us. Festus' response would be like this. He's like, Paul, you crazy. I'm sorry, I imagine him saying it. <laughs> you crazy, Paul. He's like, you're, you're insane. You gotta be out of your mind to think something like this. King Agrippa, however, will have a little bit different response. Verse 25. But Paul replied, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is a sober truth. And King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly, for I am sure these events are familiar to him, for they were not done in a corner. I mean, he's setting them up here, right? <laughs> King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And King Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone in this audience might become the same as I am, except maybe for these chains. A little humor, Paul. <laughs> then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood and left. And as they went out, they talked it over and agreed, this man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but they're basically like, we would just let you go if you hadn't appealed to Caesar. But here's the thing. After Paul is attacked by Festus, right? You're crazy, Paul. You're insane. He wisely turns his attention to King Agrippa because Agrippa is Jewish. And Agrippa would have been very knowledgeable about the Old Testament and all that the prophets said and wrote about in it. So Paul appeals to Agrippa's position as Jewish royalty and his understanding of scripture. Agrippa's response, though, is very different than Festus. He responds, 
with a second common response of people when they hear the scandalous message of Jesus. He just chooses to avoid. It's a little arrogant on King Agrippa's part, right? His response. He lets Paul know that there is no way he's even going to go down the road of being persuaded to become like him and follow Jesus. Ain't happening, buddy. He just avoids the subject altogether. So much so that immediately after Paul says his last word, Agrippa and Bernice, they just get up and leave. They're like, look, we've heard enough. We're not interested in knowing anymore. We're out of here. Fine. You don't need to go to you know, prison. You don't need to be put to death. But I don't want to hear another word about this. Neither Agrippa nor Festus feel that Paul is worthy of death or imprisonment, but they're not going to sit and listen to him blabber on about this scandalous message of Jesus. We're out of here. What Paul was hoping for, though, was a third response from them. It's why in his final words to them, he says this, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. You see, as Paul speaks to Festus and Agrippa, and it's likely there were other people in the room at the time, he's looking for one response. And it's not attack, and it's not avoid, it's acceptance. P Paul is desperate for people to accept the scandalous message of Jesus. He will put his life on the line. That one might accept it. His hope is that the message of Jesus, in all of its aspects and variety, difficult and easy, would be accepted by all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, he says. He knows it is the only way for a person to experience true change, true hope in their life. You can scan the world, Paul would say, and you can look in every nook and cranny of it, and you will not find what you find in the scandalous message of Jesus. You will not find life like you will find in the person of Jesus. During the last couple of Sundays, we, we've taken a close look at the fact that Paul, Paul's private life is being revealed in public right before Festus and King Agrippa. It's clear that his devotion and intimate connection with God has completely changed who he is. And, and they're struggling to figure out what do we do with Paul because these Jewish believers over here, or excuse me, these Jewish men and women, they're, they're claiming all these things against Paul. But when we look at him, we see a totally different person renewed by whatever is going on in his life. We've also looked closely at how obedience truly activates that change that Paul has experienced. That when a person has a profound encounter with the living Jesus like Paul did and has obedience to the vision that Jesus has given to their lives, man, look out. And so as we come to the end of chapter 26, it becomes clear that the reason Paul is who he is and has been incredibly obedient to Jesus' vision for his life is because he has chosen to respond to the scandalous message of Jesus in only one way, acceptance. Anything that Jesus said and instructed, Paul did. He didn't attack it. He certainly didn't avoid it. He followed through with it. Now, this doesn't mean that there wasn't a place for doubt for Paul. There are places throughout the book of Acts and in his letters where we see him questioning things, trying to work out the message of Jesus, trying to work out how it applies to his life. But even in Paul's doubt and questioning, he continues to accept the message of Jesus just as it is and relies on it to bring clarity where he is uncertain. I just want to say it again. These are the, by far the most common responses to the scandalous message of Jesus. People will choose to either attack it Avoid it or accept it. There's really no other response to it. I mean, you see this happen in the Gospels and throughout Paul's letters. People consistently respond in one of these three ways. And I want to ask you, what's your response? What is your response to the scandalous message of Jesus? 
All of it. Every inch of it. Are you prone to attack, to avoid, or to humbly accept? Do you believe the message of Jesus and aspects of it are just nonsense and those who believe in it are just crazy people like Paul, at least what Festus believed Paul to be? Would you rather just avoid the whole thing altogether like Agrippa, out of sight, out of mind, right? Just move on with life, pretend like it never existed. It's fine for other people, but you're sort of indifferent to the whole idea and would rather just not get involved. You know, the other uh, day I was, you know, I came across this video and uh, I would, man, I was really like taken aback. I had to watch it twice. Um, there's this pastor, I won't go, this is not like me usually, but I'm gonna just talk about it anyway. There's this pastor, I won't say where, I won't even say who they are. But they basically were just saying, it looked like there was the start of their sermon and they got up and the pastor said, uh, hey, you notice that um, we didn't read all of the passage that Paul wrote there. And that's because part of it is just, ugh, yikes. And I thought, oh no. No, 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 that's yikes. Now look, I am not trying to disparage somebody here, but it just revealed to me, I think, a thinking and a process that we as followers of Jesus in America are prevalent to. We come across a passage of scripture or a part of the scandalous nature of Jesus' message and we're like surprised by it. Like, oh my gosh, right? We, we knew going in, that it was all scandalous, or at least we should have. And then when we come across it, we're like shocked by it. We're like, well, that can't be for me. Can't possibly be for me. And so what do we do? We do one of those three things. We either attack it and we say, oh man, like this is ridiculous. And here's all the reasons why. And you've got to be crazy to believe this. Or what's probably most likely we avoid it. We just kind of go, yikes. And we're like, we're not going to talk about that for a while. Or we have the opportunity to accept it. You know, the message of Jesus, I wanna say this really clearly, is not a choose your own adventure message. Okay? You don't get to just flip through and be like, ah, that's a good part, Jesus, let's do that. I'm gonna skip over that part about sex though. Cause man, me and my girlfriend, we got it going on. Like that's not what this is. It's all or nothing. That's what Jesus gives you. I know we're all praising. We're like, yes, but y'all are going to go home and you're going to read Romans and you're going to be like, wait a second, where's the loophole here? You know you're going to do it. So listen, now look, there's a ton of grace for all of us, okay? But I, I just, we got to be real for a second. We live in a day and age where everybody's just trying to like tear things apart and break things down. And I'm just like, man, this is, this is a message that has stood the test of time. We, we do not, we have not evolved to the place where all of a sudden we got smarter than Jesus and we were like, we could take this, but we don't need that Jesus anymore. We're just too modernized to actually have to do that. No, we can live with our boyfriend or our girlfriend without being married. We've evolved beyond whatever the Bible says about something like that. We don't get to make those, why, get quiet in here. <laughs> right? I know you talk about gener generosity, Jesus, and you want us to be selfless and you want us to help the least of these, but you know, life is just so busy now. Like, how am I supposed to do all of that? And I got all these expenses. I just bought this brand new car and my payment's $800 a month. I don't know how I'd ever give. Oh, now we're talking, right? Now listen, I, look, your here is, man, there's a lot of grace, but God is calling us to deeper acceptance of the scandalous message that he has given us. We have got to be people if we want to make an impact in the world, which is on the wall out there. And we don't just write it on the wall because we're like, that's a cool world. We're like, that's who we want to be. We have got to be people who take seriously the message of Jesus. And when we fall short, we, we return back to him and we say, God, teach me again. Help me again. If we don't do that, then what kind of a faith are we living? At worst, we're living a false faith. At very best, it's an incomplete one. 
Are you willing and ready to respond by accepting that who Jesus is? This is the most important decision you can make in your life. It has implications for you now, but it has implications for where you end up in eternity. Are you ready to respond by accepting that Jesus is who he says he is, what he did and said is all reliable and it is worth your acceptance? Because only of, those one, only of one of those responses, attack, avoid, accept, leads to a truly changed life and hope for eternity. Only one of those responses frees a person from sin and shame. Only one of those responses is able to take the pain of our past and actually use it for good. Only one of those responses leads to a life that is strong in its weakest moments and has purpose beyond imagination. Only in accepting the scandalous, and it is scandalous, friends, the scandalous nature of the message of Jesus does any of that become reality. God is nudging you this morning. He is opening up maybe some wounds, maybe some dark corners. He is nudging you to maybe accept the message of Jesus for the very first time. So I don't get, you don't have to get it all. You just got to know this, that Jesus came and died and rose again for you because he loved you. And yeah, his message is scandalous, but it is good and it is beautiful. And I'm going to give you a, an opportunity to simply receive and accept that today. But for those of you who maybe have already accepted that message, on a macro level at least, believe Jesus is Savior and Lord I want to ask if there are things you're tacking or avoiding that the word of God keeps bringing up to you. Are there things in the message of Jesus that you keep attacking or avoiding because you just don't like it very much? Is there something or some things that you've been avoiding either because you're afraid of what it might mean for your life or because you just don't want to deal with it? Right? Have you been avoiding or attacking God's desire for your finances? Have you just been like, God, I can't deal with that right now. I, I just, it's too much for me. H have you been attacking or avoiding what he does have to say about relationships and marriage and sex? Have you been attacking or avoiding what he has to say about raising children or working with integrity, serving others, loving the, least, the less fortunate? You know, as I wrote this message, um, I became painstakingly aware that there are some things I've been avoiding lately. It kind of, it kind of sucked, to be honest with you. I was like, man, now I, this is a great message. And then I got to this part. I was like, dang it. <laughs> and the, the reason I've been avoiding them is because I just don't want to deal with it. I really don't want to deal with it. And yet I know that Jesus is nudging me in this area. He's in particular nudging me to bring healing to a relationship in my life. And I, I think it's one that will require me accepting the truth in particular of Matthew 18. Now, don't worry, it's none of you. <laughs> I don't want you to worry. You'll be like, oh, is it me? Yeah, no, it's none of you in this room, I promise. But I've been avoiding it. I've just been like, I, I don't have time for that. I don't want to deal with that. Maybe if I avoid it long enough, it'll just go away. Right? Because that's how life works. That's, I've learned that, right? It's not how it works. Nor will God allow it to work that way. He loves me and he loves us too much to let us live with unresolved conflict with those we care for and love. And I know that he wants me to accept the truth of what he says about relationships and take action. But I've been avoiding it. And so what about you? It's my guess that God is bringing some things to mind for you, things you've been avoiding, things you've been attacking, things that he's asking you, I, I need you to accept this. It's for your own good. It's because I love you. And so I want to give all of us an opportunity this morning to confess, to name those things that we've been avoiding and attacking in our lives and begin to take a step towards accepting them. Not just because God said so, but because he said so in love for you.
I'm going to give all of us an opportunity this morning to course correct in our lives, to repent in areas where we might be attacking or avoiding the scandalous message of Jesus and return back to him, to accept what God has said, to accept what Jesus is asking of us. So let's pray together. And I just want this to be a time It could be a time of grief and sorrow, of confession and repentance, of awareness and realization that Jesus is stirring by his spirit in us. You know, we sang this song that Holy Spirit come rest on us. And in this moment, I know that the spirit is stirring in us the message of Jesus in its purest form and the desire and need to accept it as it is. Some of us are going to need to walk out of this room and make some changes to be obedient to God's vision for our lives. And so as we pray this morning, I just want to give you an opportunity, a space in quiet to do what God is asking of you this morning. to accept what he is bringing to you. For some in this room, that might be for the very first time saying, Jesus, in all of its scandalous nature, I accept. I believe that you are who you say you are. That you came and lived a life for me and died a death for me and rose again three days later to give me new life that begins now and goes on forever and ever and ever. I've been avoiding it, I've been attacking it, but I accept it this morning. The Bible says that when we believe that and we confess that with our mouths, that he saves us, that we are put in right relationship with God again. And God, for all of us, I just, man, it's eye-opening sometimes to read these, these stories and to, to see what is happening in and behind the words and then through the words that are on the page seeing the ways in which we commonly respond. Nothing has changed, God. This morning, we confess that we too often attack or avoid the message that you have given us, the truth that you have given us in the scriptures. We confess that and we want to be people, God, who not only confess it, but repent of it, turn back to you and accept as hard and as challenging as it might be, whatever it is that be, may best honor you would be best uh, best serve to make us obedient to the vision that you've given to our lives. That's who we want to be. Will you do new work in us? Will your spirit rest upon us this morning? Begin to help us heal and grieve and confess and move forward to greater acceptance of your scandalous message. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.